Hello and welcome to lecture number 10. This presentation will address the time period from the years following the War of 1812 to the presidency of Andrew Jackson. There are several important themes to be addressed in this lecture. First, we will investigate two issues involving the early 1820s. One resulted in the Missouri Compromise, and the other led to the Monroe Doctrine. Next, we'll explore the emergence of Andrew Jackson in his years in office. The first series of events took place during the so-called Era of Good Feelings. The Era of Good Feelings is the name given to the time period from 1817 to 1825. This coincided with the presidency of James Monroe. It was given this title by a journalist who noticed that President Monroe was greeted with popular support as he toured New England following his electoral victory. As we will see, this label is somewhat misleading. However, the fighting between different political parties was absent from this era. Good feelings were not associated with the Missouri Crisis. This began when the Territory of Missouri applied for statehood in 1819. It was controversial because Missouri applied to enter the Union as a slave state rather than a free state. To complicate matters, in 1819 there was balance between the free and slave states. If Missouri entered the Union as a slave state, it would upset this balance in the Senate. By viewing this map of the Missouri Crisis, you can see the location of Missouri. If Missouri entered the Union as a slave state, slavery would move farther northward. The nearby states of Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio had all entered as free states, or states where slavery was prohibited. When a proposal was made to gradually emancipate slaves in the state of Missouri, a harsh debate ensued along sectional lines in Congress. Northerners supported the proposal, while those from the South were opposed. Each side accused the other of leading the nation toward civil war. Just as it was necessary in the past, a compromise was needed to resolve this crisis. One individual emerged who was able to craft such a compromise. He was the Speaker of the House, Henry Clay. The series of proposals he worked out came to be known as the Missouri Compromise. First, Missouri entered the Union as a slave state. This made many in the South, and Missouri, happy. Secondly, Maine entered the Union as a free state in order to ensure the balance between free and slave states. As you can see here, Maine entered the Union as a free state and Missouri became a slave state. At the time, there was a dividing line, often referred to as the Mason-Dixon Line, which ran the course of the Ohio River, which separated the Union into free and slave states. The third provision of the Compromise addressed the expansion of slavery so another crisis didn't erupt again. In the future, Congress prohibited the expansion of slavery in the Louisiana Territory north of the latitude line 36 degrees 30 minutes. So the Missouri Compromise line allowed for the expansion of slavery to the south, however north of this line, which is circled on the map, slavery was prohibited by Congress. At the time, most Americans believed the South had gained the most from this series of events. Missouri became a slave state, and territory north of the Missouri Compromise Line was believed to be unsuitable for slave labor anyway. However, Southerners had agreed to the concept that Congress could prohibit slavery in some American territories. Overall, this was important because it foreshadowed controversies and arguments which would plague the nation until the Civil War. There were also several important issues involving the nation's foreign affairs in the 18-teens and 1820s. President James Monroe had several successes with his foreign policy. In many ways, this was due to his excellent Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, the son of former President John Adams. During his tenure, Adams negotiated several agreements which had an impact on the nation. The first addressed American access to Oregon. The circled area on this map indicates the location of the Oregon country 
Both the Americans and British claimed the region, and eventually agreed to jointly occupy the territory for a minimum of ten years. This agreement was important, as it opened Oregon to future American expansion. The second set of issues Adams addressed dealt with American relations with Spain and control of Florida. Conflict arose when General Andrew Jackson led American forces into parts of Florida under the pretext he was protecting Americans from hostile Indians crossing the border. This caused an uproar as Jackson occupied Spanish forts and hanged two British citizens. But Adams used these events to his advantage. In what became known as the adams onis Treaty, signed in 1819, Adams aggressively argued the Spanish could not control its residents of Florida. Therefore, Spain ceded all of Florida to the United States. In return for this concession of territory, the United States renounced its claims to Texas. Furthermore, Spain also agreed to abandon its claims to Oregon. Overall, this was a tremendous diplomatic achievement for Adams. One final area of diplomatic success was seen with the Monroe Doctrine. One of the first concerns which led to the declaration of the Monroe Doctrine was the independence movement in Latin America in the years of the early 1800s. In this era, several Spanish colonies in particular declared their independence. The concern was, now that they've obtained their independence, will other European powers try to replace Spain? The arrows on this map point to some of the colonies where the independence movement was strong. Among others, these include the modern-day nations of Mexico, Colombia, and Peru. A second concern involved Russia. Russian fur traders had explored southward along the Pacific coast and through the Oregon Territory. Some had even traveled as far south to what is now Northern California. Continental Russia is shown with the circle on this map. Alaska was still Russian territory in the early 1800s, so Russian fur traders established a presence along the Pacific coast as they looked to expand the fur trade. The American concern was that the presence of Russians could possibly threaten United States claims to Oregon. Finally, the British Foreign Secretary offered to make an important joint declaration with the Americans. Each would oppose European interference with these newly independent nations and renounce their own interest in establishing any new colonies in the region. This was a startling offer, but if they agreed to it, it would interfere with American expansion and make the United States subservient to the British as they would clearly be the junior partner in any such arrangement. John Quincy Adams proposed the United States issue its own independent declaration. This declaration was the Monroe Doctrine, and while the name attached to the document is Monroe, its primary author was Adams himself. The Monroe Doctrine was issued in late 1823 as part of President Monroe's annual message to Congress. First, it declared European powers could no longer interfere with independent nations in the Western Hemisphere. Secondly, the United States would not allow for the creation of any new colonies in the Americas. These first two provisions address the issues of protecting the freedom of those newly independent nations in Latin America and stopping Russian expansion into Oregon. Finally, in return, the United States pledged to stay out of European affairs as Greek rebels were fighting for their independence against the Turkish Empire. Europeans scoffed as it would take Britain's Royal Navy to enforce the non-interference declarations. However, this was an incredibly important document. In many ways, the Monroe Doctrine became the foundation of American foreign policy. The United States in essence declared, Europe, stay out of our backyard. This continues to be an important part of American foreign policy today. While James Monroe sailed to two easy victories while he was running for president during the era of good feelings, the election of 1824 became very controversial. 
This was a unique presidential election as there were four major candidates running for office and they all described themselves as members of the same political party. The first candidate was Tennessee's Andrew Jackson, the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. Next was John Quincy Adams. He had recently engineered several successes while serving as Secretary of State. Henry Crawford was the third candidate. He was from Georgia and had served as Secretary of the Treasury. Finally, Speaker of the House Henry Clay was also a candidate. He was from the state of Kentucky. Each of the candidates received their support from their respective regions of the country. However, a majority of electoral votes was required to win the election. In 1824, a majority consisted of 131 electoral votes. Andrew Jackson clearly was the winner of the popular vote by the American people. However, the votes were also spread out among the candidates because there were so many running for office. As this slide shows, no candidate, even Andrew Jackson, was able to gather a majority of electoral votes. This meant, once again, it was unsure who the winner of this election would be. If no candidate wins a majority of electoral votes, according to the Constitution, the United States House of Representatives chooses the winner among the top three finishers in the election. Essentially, however, the House had to choose between Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams. Clay was out because he had finished fourth in electoral votes. Crawford was out because he suffered a stroke around the election. While Clay could not win the presidency, he could have an influence over who won as he was still serving as Speaker of the House. Clay was not personally close to Adams, but the two did agree on many political issues. So Clay used his influence in the House to help Adams win the presidency. Supporters of Jackson were upset when they heard the news. However, they became infuriated when Adams announced that Henry Clay would serve as his Secretary of State. It appeared as if a corrupt bargain had been struck between them to award Adams the presidency. In the future, Clay would then use his new position in the cabinet to succeed Adams in the White House. No evidence of any such bargain has ever been found, but it's clear the appearance of wrongdoing hurt the Adams administration. He was possibly one of the best prepared presidents in history as he had served as a diplomat and senator and had just completed his tenure as Secretary of State. But his administration seemed doomed to failure. His proposals for expanded internal improvements, a second Bank of the United States, and funding for the arts met with fierce opposition among many. It seemed, like his father before him, he was destined to serve only one term as president. Not long after Adams was named the winner of the election, supporters of Jackson rallied to their candidate. They called themselves Democrats and supported a return to the ideas of Thomas Jefferson. Accusations reached new lows in this election as Adams was accused of promoting gambling because he purchased a billiards table. He was even accused of securing a prostitute for the leader of Russia. Jackson was accused of being an illiterate backwoodsman and his wife was labeled an adulterer and bigamist. In the end, Jackson won the election handily, as you can see with this map. What was also clear is that with this election, the supposed era of good feelings had come to an end. The rise of Andrew Jackson is often associated with the spread of democracy in the United States. We will now explore links between democracy and Andrew Jackson. One of the trends when investigating American society as a whole in the early 19th century is the trend toward the elimination of property ownership as a qualification to vote. As a man of the people, Jackson advocated the elimination of these restrictions, and by the 1840s, they had largely been lifted. However, maybe the most important symbol of Jacksonian democracy came with his inauguration. In the far right of this image, we see Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans urging American forces to fight. Thousands traveled to the nation's capital to see their hero, Old Hickory, take the oath of office. This seemed to embody the popular support for this American hero. Finally, Jackson argued the will of the American people should govern the nation. 
Toward that end, he was ahead of his time by advocating that voters should directly elect officials at the national level, such as senators and the president. Today, we still have the Electoral College, but the American people directly elect members of the Senate. Taken together, those ideas help to provide some explanation of what was known as Jacksonian democracy. We will now explore some controversies associated with Jackson's administration. In 1828, Congress passed a protective tariff on imported items to encourage American manufacturers, primarily in New England. This was unpopular among Southerners as it raised the cost of manufactured items and encouraged other nations to establish their own tariffs. This hurt the South's economy as they exported many goods to Europe. South Carolina, in particular, had an interesting response to this issue. In 1828, an anonymous author wrote the South Carolina Exposition and Protest in which it was argued the Tariff of Abominations, passed in 1828, was unconstitutional. Furthermore, it argued states had the right to nullify the tariff. Does that sound a little familiar? The political theories included in the South Carolina Exposition and Protest were based on the same arguments of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison in the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. Those had been written in the 1790s in response to the Alien and Sedition Acts. While the author of this document was unknown in 1828, before long it was discovered that the person who wrote it was none other than Andrew Jackson's Vice President, John C. Calhoun. Andrew Jackson may not have been a strong supporter of the high tariff, but he clearly did not support the concept of nullification. When it was learned that Calhoun had authored this document, it created a huge rift between Jackson and Calhoun. Calhoun eventually resigned as vice president. Once again, a compromise was necessary for the nation to emerge from this nullification crisis. A compromise was reached with a new tariff bill passed in 1833. This gradually reduced rates over a period of 10 years. However, Congress also passed the force bill which authorized the president to use force if necessary to collect tariff revenues. The person able to broker this compromise was none other than Henry Clay. As a result of his work, he eventually was known as the Great Compromiser. Another controversy which led to a showdown with Jackson involved the Bank of the United States. Andrew Jackson felt a strong suspicion of the bank as he, and others, believed some of its past policies led to an economic depression or a panic in 1819. In 1832, Congress passed a renewal of the bank's charter. Jackson promptly vetoed the legislation, charging the bank was unconstitutional and harmful to the nation as it only served the interests of wealthy elites in American society. Jackson's assault on the bank continued following his re-election in 1832, during which he easily defeated Henry Clay. Jackson began withdrawing federal money from the bank, instead placing it in state banks nicknamed pet banks. This had the initial impact of facilitating access to loans for farmers, but in the long run, it may have contributed to the nation's economic downturn in 1837, as many of the state banks remained unregulated. In 1836, when its charter expired, the Bank of the United States ceased to exist. Opponents of Jackson began to unite and called themselves Whigs. They labeled Jackson a monarch and called him King Andrew I. The title Whig was adopted as this was the name given to opponents of King George III in Britain's Parliament. So not only do we see the emergence of the Democratic Party while Jackson was in office, but the Second American Party system was also developed. <laughs> 
Jackson was associated with democracy during this era, but there were also some clear limits to what was meant by Jacksonian democracy. One example of a limit to Jackson's views of democracy was the fact he was a slaveholder. I have visited Jackson's plantation in Nashville, Tennessee, and it's a great place to see. However, one of the things one can view would be the slave quarters at his estate. By the 1840s, there were about 140 slaves living on his plantation. So while Jackson argued he was a man of the people, he was referring to white people. A second example of Jackson's limited views toward democracy would be in his attitudes toward women. He did not believe in equality for women, and he certainly didn't support expanding the right to vote to include women. When he spoke of democracy, he was talking about the rights of white men. One final example of limits to Jacksonian democracy would be Jackson's support of Indian removal. This map shows the location of several Indian nations prior to European contact. Native Americans were seen by many in the United States as a barrier to American economic advancement and supported the removal of Indians to what some had called the Great American Desert. Jackson was a supporter of this removal policy. Perhaps the story of the Cherokee can best illustrate this policy. In the years following the American Revolution, they were told to assimilate into American society. Over the years, they adopted a written constitution, modeled after the United States Constitution, and began growing cotton like their white neighbors. Some even owned slaves. However, gold was discovered on their land, and the state of Georgia continued to press for control over Cherokee land. The Supreme Court became involved with a series of rulings in the early 1830s. Essentially, Chief Justice John Marshall argued the Cherokee should not be forced to leave their land. President Jackson ignored this decision and invoked the Indian Removal Act. Later, a treaty was negotiated with some minor Cherokee leaders, which called for the Cherokee to abandon their land in return for cash payments. Not all agreed with the treaty. However, in 1838, the Cherokee were forcibly removed from their land in what was called the Trail of Tears. It's estimated between 15 to 18,000 were forced to move from Georgia to Oklahoma, about a quarter of whom died along the way. For more information about the Cherokee and the Trail of Tears, you may click on the hyperlinks below. There are a few final thoughts which can be considered when evaluating the subject matter covered in this presentation. This lecture has identified two important events from the 1820s, the Missouri Crisis and Monroe Doctrine. Each would have a significant impact on the nation's history. Finally, you may want to consider the accomplishments and limitations of Andrew Jackson as president. How would you evaluate his administration overall? This concludes lecture number 10. I hope you learned something new today. The next few slides will provide links to additional information as well as a list of sources used for this presentation. Have a great day.